My guest tonight is not only the world's greatest surfer, but one of the most decorated athletes in any sport of all time. In a career spanning three decades, Robert Kelly Slater has won a record 11 world championships, has more career tour victories than anyone else in the sport's history, and was the first surfer to achieve a perfect score of 20 in a competition heat. But before he set the record for most event wins in a season, did you know he entered and won his first surfing contest at the age of eight? Traveled the coast and slept in a van as a teenager searching for waves and was named one of People Magazine's 100 Most Beautiful People. Well, tonight we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is, a man who once said, surfing is my religion, if I have one. Please welcome the man with the distinction of being both the youngest and the oldest world champion surfer, Kelly Slater. Hi, bud. Hi. That's yours. <clears throat> Thank you. I think I speak on behalf of every woman in the crowd when I say, God damn, you're good looking. <laughs> huh? Does it get old? <laughs> Your story is incredible. And, and the more I dig into it and the more I learn about it, the more I'm fascinated by it. Uh, you know, I'm anxious to know what life was like as a kid in uh, Florida for Kelly Slater. But yeah, I grew up in a house, an older brother, Sean, uh, younger brother, Stephen, um, three years above me and six years below. But my dad was actually a really fun dad. You know, he liked to wrestle with us, and he took us to the beach or fishing or camping and anything outdoors my dad loved. He, he taught us how to shoot and take apart guns by the time we were, you know, probably six or eight years old. And make bullets. Make bullets, yeah. But we were like... Wait, you it, were a six-year-old making bullets. Probably eight. Eight. Yeah, eight. I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I don't mean to offend. You were an eight-year-old making bullets. <laughs> yeah, this is a different time, you know? It was a, it was a, it, we were, my dad was kind of a good old boy from the South, and, and um, it, you know, I, I, it would seem strange to me now to have, like, a, a gun rack of shotguns in my house if I, you know, had my family there. But is that, is my, that you with the, the dummy on your lap? I wanted to be a ventriloquist, yeah. <laughs> Did you really or not? Yeah. No, saying? I did, and that was all I wanted for Christmas was that and that little, um, little uh, battery operate, operated thing that went about a quarter mile an hour. <laughs> I had one of those things too, but yeah. the ventriloquism, that's got me right now. So can you do anything like? No, if... I, not at all. But I was a huge Steve Martin fan as a kid, oh. so I thought he was just funny. I wanted to be, I actually wanted to be an actor when I was a kid. I wanted to be a comedian, and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I remember that was all I wanted that year. I get the sense reading about you, your mom was a spectacular lady and yeah. really, really strong in the backbone. My mom moved to moved from Maryland to Florida when she was about uh, 19, and she worked out at NASA. And, you know, everyone moved to Central Florida to work at the Space Center. And my mom, uh, by the time I was about eight years old, she became uh, EMT and firefighter. And she was the first female firefighter in our county. And um, you know, all the guys were trying to tell her she couldn't do it and all this stuff. And, um, uh, but, you know, she was determined. My mom had this crazy sort of fighting spirit. I think I get my competitiveness from her because she never, she didn't grow up playing tennis, but then when she got to Cocoa Beach, she was kind of in the social club and she got into playing tennis. And there was this one friend of mine, uh, his mother, no one liked and no one would play tennis with her. So my mom said, I'll, I'll join you, you know, we'll make a team. And my mom and her beat everyone in the tennis club. And my mom wasn't like a country club woman at all. She was like pretty sort of rough around the edges, you know. What I remember is my, my parents split up when I was about 10, 12 years old. Um, my dad moved out. My mom basically raised three kids on about $500 a week and um, kept, a, you know, kept a house over our heads and gave us lunch money and got us a surf contest, so. Were you competitive as a kid? I think I was super competitive. My, um, you know, Sean and I, we, we had this hallway, and um, Sean, my older brother, and I would play football in the hallway, and you had to get past each other. And I was a lot smaller than him, but it kind of made me tough and competitive. Sean and I were really competitive with a lot of different things. Um, I, I even heard uh, in the bathtub, like, who got the deep, deep end, end in the bathtub. Yeah, absolutely. But the deep but end is really the front end, right? Where the water comes down. Yeah, water comes down, it's warmer, it's a little deeper, it's like, you're in control. It was always, <laughs> that's, a, that's a thing, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> You're always in control. I, you know, Sean would inevitably turn the shower on and put it on hot, and I'd get scalded. And, you know. and even, I'm sure, stupid stuff, like who gets to the oh, car first. Oh, yeah, shotgun. And then, you know, my brother would make up some rule, like, no, you're standing on a roof, you can't call shotgun on a roof, shotgun. I got it. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, I'm older than you, shut up, go in the back. <laughs> like, so that, I just was constantly kind of belittled by him in that way. So I, you know, my outlet was to, I, I mean, it's, it's funny, and at the same time, like, it drove me to go, you know what, I'm gonna be way better than you at surfing. That's my thing. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna just be as good as I can possibly be. And so I just got really crazy obsessive about it. When was it that it clicked in, this is, this is me, I'm a surfer? I'd say by the time I'm seven, eight years old, I was surfing every day. I thought, wow, I, like, I'm really committed to this thing. I mean, I, I don't know what I was saying in my head exactly, but I was thinking that, and I was just trying to define myself in some way. I was like, I'm a surfer. I think I'm a surfer. And, and so I, I realized I had this, like, identity with something that I loved. And I had these, like, you know, hang ten shirts and OP socks and all the different surf labels. Right. And, you know, I read surf magazines, we put pictures up on our wall, and all my other friends were like into football and basketball and baseball and stuff. As a kid, my dad took me to all my contests, and he loved the contest because there was a social scene there he really liked. He got to see all his friends, and he'd drink some beers, and he, you know, for him it was a, a, a way to go have a fun day. And he would take me to contests, and I would like go, Dad, did you see me surf? You know? He'd, oh, yeah, you did good, man. <laughs> good job. My dad was blind in one eye, and he was drunk half the time, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what he saw, but <laughs> he must have seen two of me. And tell me about the equipment that you were using back then. I mean, it's for this sport, yeah. I mean, you need a great board. And did you have a great board to begin with? No, back then, our, the equipment was pretty rudimentary. It was all made for older guys. And so they would take the big guys' boards and cut them down. So they didn't have the right curves and shapes for us. I, I just had it in my mind from an early age. I, became, I came out to California when I was 12, started surfing here every summer. And I made a bunch of friends, and I started surfing with all the best guys here. And I was like, I can beat these guys, you know? But like, better waves here than Better you... waves here, yeah, better waves out here, too. Because in Florida, as a kid, you guys had to get creative. So here you have places in Santa Barbara, like Rincon Point, or you have waves in the south, uh, south of Orange County, like trestles, that are kind of long waves, and they're drawn out. And it's, it's easy to take your time and draw out a nice line and sort of paint your picture on a wave. In Florida, we have really short waves that are small and kind of choppy and messy. So it was a different style of surfing. You know, to, to just give everyone a, a very brief picture of it, East Coast and West Coast had big rivalries. So East Coast, I mean, it's like the rap game. It's like the it's rap like the rap game, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, but, you know, the, the East Coast surfers kind of looked down upon, kind of frowned upon, because we didn't have as big a surf, and we didn't ever have any, like, world champions and all this kind of stuff. So we were sort of like the oppressed group of surfers from the East right. Coast. My favorite surfer was always Tom Curran from Santa Barbara. He was three-time world champion. I, you know, he influenced basically everyone in my generation and beyond. His style, he was, he, he grew up surfing Rincon, grew up in Santa Barbara, and his style was very flowing and smooth. And I grew up surfing with a bunch of guys who, they were good surfers, but their style was to do aerials and ollie hops and, you know, these really short, weird maneuvers that were kind of just beginning. And so I wanted to be able to blend Tom Curran power and style and flow with that more of a trick style that's kind of come in. And now it's crazy. I mean, guys are doing huge flips and, you know, 720 errors and stuff. But, um, but back then, it was you're just trying to get the board above the wave. And there was one guy in particular from Florida that was never a, a well-known guy named John Holman. And he used to go down line on a wave and get some speed. And he would jump up and like do this ollie hop and do a full 360 in the air. And I'd never seen anyone do something like that until him. And still, right now, that's, there, there's an advancement on that maneuver, which is called the Air 360. That if you just do it high and you completely rotate, it's, it's sort of like the most rewarded maneuver on tour right now today. And he was doing this in, like, 1980. So it was so far ahead of its time. And I was influenced by a lot of guys like that. So I wanted to be able to bring the tricks and, and also the, the, the flow. And so I, I had to spend a lot of time out here and on longer waves, kind of learning how to link things together and look good and make my style look all right. Can you look back and believe that you were as good as you were, as young as you were? I mean, I know you enter your first competition and you win it at the age of eight. Well, let's be honest. There was four kids in that, and I think three of them didn't surf. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you win the U.S. Amateur at 12. Yeah, I won the U.S. Amateur at 12 um, in, at Makaha in Hawaii. 
But What's that like as a Florida kid seeing waves in Hawaii for the first oh, time? Oh, I was terrified. The contest that got me there, <clears throat> I was surfing in a contest in Florida, and we used to have what they call a super heat. All the winners of all the divisions, every age bracket would go against each other. And generally, the junior men's or the men's would win that contest. And um, I was in the Menehunis, which was the youngest. The Menehunis, then the boys, then the juniors, then the men's, then the senior men's. So I was in the youngest division at 12. And um, I won my division, and then I went in the, in the super heat. They were giving away a ticket to Hawaii, and um, I won the thing. I was literally in tears when I won this contest. I cried for like an hour. I was so happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it sort of comes back now. It's, it was like, it was such a turning point in my life because we didn't have the money to get uh, anywhere, you know? We really didn't have the money. Like, I couldn't have gone and surfed the, the U.S. Championships if, we didn't, if I didn't win that. But it was a new arena for you. Yeah, I won the U.S. Championship when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe even 16. I don't know, I won the East Coast title, I think, six times straight. When I was 13 and when I was 14, each of those years, I won pro, pro tournaments as an amateur. As a little kid, and I beat all the best guys. On like East against Coast. guys who were how old? Uh, oh, any age didn't matter. All the way up. Yeah, all the pros from the East Coast. And, and then um, when I was 15, I flew to California. I won a contest in a wave pool in Irvine. That was all the best pros in America in that contest. We're in a water park. In a water park, yeah, in a wave pool. <laughs> Mind you, it I was 15. Doesn't sound that glamorous. I was 15. I hadn't gone through puberty yet, so okay. I was still pretty small, <laughs> and I was light. And so in that fresh water on a small wave, I could get moving. And um, so, yeah, I was an amateur, and I won that contest. As a young man, you had a chance to turn pro if you wanted to, mm. but I know you wanted to have the high school experience, which, yeah. I, which I think shows a tremendous amount of foresight to know that this is not something that I don't want to be a part of. Mm. What was that decision-making process like for you? Yeah, I wanted to finish high school. You know, funny enough, I was sort of this one quote from a, a guy that was a, an influence on me, he was a, not a surfer, but he was a bodyboarder, a guy named Mike Stewart, who I still believe to this day is one of the all-time great surfers, however you ride a wave. But he's a real smart guy. He's super into math and all sorts of inventions. And he's, he's invented 20 or 30 things, I think, from memory. But he also said, you know, high school is easy. If you can't finish high school, you can't finish anything. And I remember hearing him say that, and I'm like, I'm finishing high school. I mean, I graduated with a 4.6 GPA, and I... I would say, I, I don't even know if I put in my best effort. You know, I was gone a lot, I was traveling. My uh, senior year of school, I never took a book home. I made, I, I made a pact with myself that I would never have homework that year. So I had to finish everything either at school, like I stay, if I, I got a study hall too that year, so. I got the study hall at the end of the day. So because just, when you got home, you wanted to. I wanted to just go surf, and I, I didn't want to be bothered with work, with school work and stuff, but. It's, it's like a scene out of a movie, though, Kelly. At the end of high school, you guys graduate. Your class goes to Disney World in Florida. Yeah. And we had project graduation yeah, right at the end of high school. But how neat is this? And, and I think it speaks to your mom, too. She's waiting for you at a truck stop while the bus is going back toward yeah. the Orlando airport. Straight away, I, f I flew to Mexico the next day, that, that morning. Well, yeah, later yeah. that morning. Yeah. We, so we. Actually, what my mom did was there was me and a, a, a girl I knew in school named Claire, and she actually was going on a family vacation. So my mom organized to meet us. We slept in the car, and then my mom put us on the plane in the morning. <laughs> yeah. She, she definitely went uh, above and beyond a lot for me. This is a woman who's raising three boys and, and working yeah. as hard as she can. And, yeah. But also had the respect for the rest of the class that it wasn't a, it wasn't going to be. Look at the spotlight, kid Kelly. We're just going to nonchalantly yeah, take it, him off the well, bus. She also probably was trying to pull a fast one on the uh, principal or something. <laughs> 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 there is somewhat of a launch into the great unknown for you as this kid from Florida. Kind of, you think you're good. You know, you've won the amateurs, but yeah. but the, something inside you knew that you were different. But what's the end game? What's what are your goals here? I didn't want to win the world title one time and be done with it. I, I knew that my bigger goal was to, I wanted to win multiple world, world titles. Um, you know, Tom Curran was my hero. He had won three. Mark Richards had won the most. That was four. Um, he won four straight. And so I said, I really want to win five in a row. 
91, at the end of 91, they made this cutoff. If you weren't in the top 44 guys in the world, you wouldn't be on tour next year. So 44 guys, they figured they could travel around the world with that, and those are the best guys. So I didn't start surfing contests until halfway through the year, which was in June or July. Is this a point system to Point build system, it? yeah. It's a really subjective field, you know, being on these waves and who's yeah. really doing the best job. That's the, that's the one thing about our sport, like almost with, say, boxing or gymnastics or, you know, it's a judge sport. Um, diving, you know, any sport that has a subjective grading thing, it's really hard to ob objectify surfing into what it is because there's an art to it, there's a feel to it, there's, you know, it's not just, um, uh, you know, these obligatory maneuvers that you do, it's, you have to, you have to kind of read it yourself, plan out what you're going to do, feel it in the moment, sort of execute, and you really have to get your brain out of the way. You have to get your thinking out of the way. But at the same time, be mindful of what you're doing. It's it's a it's a funny sort of dichotomy where you're you're trying to get rid of that, but you have to be aware of everything at the same time. And I I um, got to the last event, uh, last event in Hawaii. Basically, I needed to make the semifinals at Pipeline, the first year I ever surfed at Pipeline, which was. Um, I had never surfed the contest pipeline. I mean, anyone who doesn't even know surfing has heard of pipeline before. It's the sort of regarded as the great wave in the world and one of the most dangerous waves in the world. I've had multiple friends die there. It's just a, it's a sort of terrifying wave as a kid. Now I'm kind of used to it. I understand what I'm dealing with, but back then I was pretty scared. But I went there and um, uh, I made the I made the semifinals. I got fifth place at the Pipe Masters. That put me in 43rd place. I sneak snuck in by one spot. And, um, and I made it on the tour the next year. And, and the next year? I won the world title the next you year. You won the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. There was an, uh, a sponsor named Marui out of Japan that made these samurai helmets. And this was the last year they sponsored it. So they had given these away for years, but I, I was the last one to win this. Don't tell me you threw that away. No way. I saw that thing this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you win in 1992, and yeah. the validation is there and and your whole life kind of changes the dynamic of it i mean you're not only a great surfer but now you're on the map and and people are starting to look at you differently differently uh, yeah i mean 92 was a uh, was a bizarre year for me because i also was on baywatch and so <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you for the my thoughts exactly <laughs> now did you guys have to run in slow motion or did they do that post i could run slow i could you run can? Slow, yeah with that weird like a spear looking thing that's supposed to save people <laughs> uh, the little yeah no, yeah see i didn't have to do that because i wasn't a lifeguard oh you weren't I was a surfer who was homeless who lived in his van who had run away from home oh and so it was a bizarre year because i and you know, as a kid, I said I wanted to be an actor. When it became reality, I didn't want to be at all. I, I, I was dreading being on that show. At that point, I was taking what I was doing surf, surf wise very seriously, and I didn't want it to be a joke, and I didn't, didn't want it to be seen as a joke. And I think, I think what I, with Baywatch, I equated so much of, um, you know, when they did CPR, they'd go like this, and somebody would cough up water and start talking to you, and they were fine. Right. You know, and. I had had friends who drowned, so I know what, I know it's a little bit different than what they show on TV, you know. So, um, I, so I felt like I, I was worried about it doing a disservice to the seriousness I took around my career, you yeah. know, around my what I considered my profession. And so, um, I, I I I was thinking maybe my manager had a power of attorney or something, but but he signed me up for the show, and he's like, no, you have to be here on a certain date. You are locked in. You are obligated. And, you, and so I had to end up flying back from Australia, and I tried everything I could to miss that flight. And I flew back, and I went to the first day, and that was when I met everyone on the show from Hasselhoff, Hasselhoff, Charvet, Pam Anderson. You know, I met the whole cast that day, and we did a photo shoot for it. And I, I was just confused by the whole thing because I didn't understand the impact that it would have. Um, beyond surfing. You took criticism for it, right? I mean, Oh, yeah. It, I'm it, so glad there was no Instagram or Twitter back then. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It would have been died. Hard. I would have killed myself. I'd have been so embarrassed. It's, I mean... <laughs> but, you know, there was other people dying to be on that TV show, and I totally respect that. I totally understand that. It, you know, there's actors who wanted that part and to be there, and they loved what they're doing. They took it seriously, and it made a career for them. And I have no qualms about that. You didn't need point. it. You no, didn't I didn't need it. it, and I didn't... I really honestly didn't want it. I almost didn't requalify. 
the following year after I won the world title. I was engaged, I had a, a girlfriend, and then we broke up. I was broke, literally in debt, and I lost the world title, and sort of everything went south that year. Right. It was just one of those years, like the year before it was like everything was great, you know, and then that year was just like, God, everything is a bummer, and I, I just had a really tough year. Did you feel like you'd let people down, like like the people that had made all those sacrifices, your mom, that, I mean, did it get that deep where you felt like you were failing them, or was it mm. just you? No, it was just me, personally. I mean, I was, to be honest, I've never really talked about it publicly, but I was, I was basically kind of suicidal at one point for a couple of weeks and um, in early 94, and I was just so sad and so depressed and I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, I was just, I, 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 yeah, that's, I don't know how else to uh, describe it. That's, um, if you're that low, something has to happen to pull you back out of that. At that point, I started to really focus everything back into my surfing <clears throat> and my goals and where I wanted to go. And, you know, not just that week or that month, but in, like in five years. And they said, well, I, I'd, I'd like to match Mark Richards, but then I would like to beat his record of four in a row and get five in a row. And, um, I kind of went on a mission at that point. Kelly Slater pulls off a convincing win, clinching the 94 world title once and for all. I would imagine for as great as it was winning the first one, and nothing's like your first, to go down and then come back up and win it all that next year really had to be something special. Yeah, it was. I remember there wasn't a big sort of hoopla about it. Very few people talking about it on the beach or anything. You know, surfing didn't have the visibility it has now back in 94. It didn't have that international media outlet. Um, you know, there weren't apps you could look at and watch it live or watch a broadcaster. You know, it was rarely ever on TV. So there, very few people knew that if I made it through the semifinals and this guy named Shane Powell didn't make it through the semifinals, that I won the world title. And I was staying with this, there was this woman that I stayed with for years, and she was at the beach. She's like, come on, Kelly, I'm pulling for you today. And I said, hey, if I make it through this next heat, and he doesn't, I win the title. She's like, really? And I was like, yeah. And I felt like we were the only two people that knew that. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one was talking about it. They weren't talking about it on the microphones and stuff. And 95, 95. Any, any difference? We, Brazil was our second to last event. I was in third place after that in the ratings. Second place was Rob Machado, who's from here from California. I, I live with Rob and his family off and on for many years. Travel with Rob, we were best friends. The guy in first place was Sonny Garcia, whose daughter is my goddaughter. Sonny's from Hawaii. He was gonna be potentially the second ever Hawaiian world champion. There was commercials on TV. Everyone, like, you get to Hawaii and all the commercials are like, come on, Sonny, we're pulling for you, bro. Like, win this thing, take it home, bring it home. And I'm like, oh, man. I want that thing too, you know? <laughs> and like, the whole thing kind of split everyone into different camps, you know? So like, people were pulling for Sonny and people were pulling for Rob and some people were pulling for me. But it just was one of those days and one of those heats and everything went against Sonny. He broke his leash, he fell on a good wave. The other guy got the perfect waves come to him and all of a sudden Sonny just lost. And I had to beat Rob in order to win the contest. So this whole thing played out literally like somebody wrote it on a script for me. Like, I was watching my life play out this day. It's a great story, and this is a moment <clears throat> that, for somebody like me who has tried to surf and can't, to see somebody <laughs> like you not only surf, but give somebody a high five while you're surfing. Wait, that was in the semifinal. So that's you in the water giving the high five yeah. to Rob going by. Mm. Um, and it kind of speaks to this friendship. It speaks to this... Uh, it's kind of team feel out there, even though you're just a, a one-man corporation out there. You know, competition a lot of times can bring out the worst in people, but it can bring out the best in people too. And I think that that moment right there was one of my favorite moments ever in my career, just that actual moment, just high-fiving Rob. And, it, you know, because he could have, what, what Rob could have done, he could have kicked off that wave and gotten out and got, we have priority, which whoever gets out first gets the next wave. So Rob could have kicked out, not come and give me a high-five, and kicked out and got priority, and used it as a competitive advantage. And instead he came by and just high-fived me and we're, you can see we're both, well, you can't see me, but you can see Rob, he got a big grin on his face and I look the same way and, you know, his two friends just happened to be at sort of the highest level of competition on that day, um, sort of celebrating it. I think it may still be the closest or second closest ever world title finish 
and Rob play second, which was really bittersweet because I wanted that thing so bad, but so did he. You know, so it's hard to be his friend and to be his competitor and be able to, to be in both roles at once. Also for, for Sonny, too. So it was a really bittersweet come from behind win for me. But it was, it was tough. Uh, I think it was tough on our friendship, too. What are you like on the day of competition? Because <clears throat> I know you're a, you're a quiet guy by nature. You're a thoughtful guy. You're a reader. But from what I understand, you're also obviously intense. But you can play the mind game pretty well from what I understand, kind of art of war, everything's fair. I, I read something about a handshake, like you'll go up and wish somebody, hey, good luck, and that's like the kiss of death. You take it the way you take it, man. That's competition. It's, I know that my personality changes around contests. I, I don't know that I do it intentionally to try to play a mind game with somebody. I just, I try to make myself comfortable however that is. If that has an effect on somebody else, it's not my problem. If they have an effect on me, it's my problem. You know, and so I, I don't, there was, a, there was a handshake that happened at a contest in, in Huntington Beach. And these guys, you know, somehow somebody had this idea, like, don't shake Kelly's hand before, you know, you, you gotta like, like shun him and like not look at, don't give him any respect, you know? And so somebody had said that, so that had sort of, been talked about a little bit. And then I had this final at Huntington Beach in 2011, I think. <clears throat> and before the heat, I just went up and shook the guy's hand. I, I mean, I wasn't like, I'm going to look in his eyes and fuck with this guy. You know, it, right. it was like, <laughs> excuse me. No, you, I, it you was, can say it. OK. I, I'm not going to look in his, in his eyes yeah. and fuck with this guy. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and so I mean, I literally, I was just like, whatever. I, it makes me comfortable. I think what happens, it, it makes me comfortable to talk to my competitor in some way. Do you talk out in the water? Occasionally. I, don't, I have no problem talking to somebody. But is that kind of not really how it happens, typically? No, some, some guys are totally fine talking. Some guys are comfortable. And some guys feel better trying to like shut you out and not talk to you. I've had guys I've tried to talk to in heats that are good friends of mine that just go, Don't look like it didn't acknowledge that I said something to him, and and uh, <laughs> I mean that's that's going out of your way to I mean they don't even say yeah hey. see I think those guys are playing mind games with me and it, then it just pissed me off and I want to beat them <laughs> right you know so then I that, I just you got to take when you compete when you're trying to be the best at something you have to take whatever you can whatever advantage you can and I try to take that from what I feel so if I feel a certain way I act on it and. You know, I don't, I've never gone up and like threatened someone or tried to, you know, I. No trash talking. No, I don't, I don't trash talk people. Look, if somebody goes out there and surfs better than me and beats me, I should have been better. You know, they, they beat me and I think that's fair. Who's with you? Are your parents coming to these events? No, I, I start in 90, at the end of 95, uh, in fact, right when I won that uh, uh, last, the title at the end of the year in 95, I just started a new relationship with a girl. A girl named Jenny, we dated for two years, um, two and a half years, something like that, at that point. So she, she and I traveled together most of that time, 96 and 97. And um, I just had this crazy focus on competition and what I wanted to do. And everything was about that, you know? I mean, it was the classic selfish professional athlete. Everything's about me for this period of time. And I, you know, I just had a goal in mind. And it seemed like, you know, you have everything in 95. How do you how do you stay motivated going to the next year? Well, now I'm sitting on three world titles, and so I'm sort of tied with Tom Curran. And I had gone two years in a row, which only a couple people had done. So 96 was uh, the year to match Mark Richards with four titles. 96 was my best year competitively ever by a long shot. I won seven of 13 events that year. Um, 90, 97, I won five of 12 events. So I, I won like 12 events in the course of two years. 97, I passed Mark Richards with five, but I had four in a row. So I was sort of tied with him again, you know, in my own mind, you know? Right. And so I said, I really want to win five in a row. 98 was um, almost the exact scenario I had in 95 with Rob and, and Sonny, because I was trying to win the five in a row. I was trying to win um, my sixth world title. I was coming from behind. And then it was all up to me to just go win three more heats at that point. 
I literally just broke down and started crying. I just like fell on the ground. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe this is happening right now. And and uh, luckily I had one of my mentors with me, <clears throat> a guy named Tom Carroll, who won two world titles in the 80s. And Tom's like a big brother. We travel together. This guy's like, he taught me about diet, taught me about working out. He's always the fittest, strongest guy on tour. Um, and Tom, when he saw this happen, he grabbed me, he said, come here. And he took me in the house I was staying at, and he let me cry a little bit. He's like, get it out, get it out. And he's like, and then, you know, let's do a little bit of yoga. Let's, let's sort of get yourself, get your mind calm. Let's, you know, so he got, he got me to just like relax in this yoga pose and just stretch and, and clear my mind and spend about an hour with me. And then I went out and just felt like I was on top of the world and won as many heats I needed to, and I, I won the world title. What, what sense are you getting from home from your parents about the pride they have in what their middle son, Kelly Slater, had become? Well, you know, my parents have always been, always been really proud of me. You know, they are proud I did well in school, and they are they're proud that I, you know, I didn't give them too much trouble growing up and that kind of stuff. Um, but, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I'll probably cry when I talk about this one because um, uh, my dad, my dad passed away in 2002, um, and I never really, um, you know, I had a lot of years where I, my, when, after my parents split up, I wasn't with my dad very much. And we didn't spend a lot of time together. We, we, we had an okay relationship, but we just, you know, he never traveled with me. He never, he never saw me at one contest on tour the whole time um, I was on tour and he was alive. And uh, I flew him to Hawaii in 2001, and he spent the winter with me. Come to, he came to watch the Pipeline Masters, and um, I got second place. And I came up the beach, and my dad was crying. And... Uh, and then it's like, I was like, what are you crying for? He's like, I'm so proud of you. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of in my head still, like, competitive. And it's like, oh, um, I'm sorry I didn't win that one, Dad. Like, I wanted to win that one for you. And I was like, I made a, you know, I made a couple mistakes out there. He's like, oh, no. He's like, he just said, like, I'm so proud of you, you know? Um, he's like, it was perfect. I couldn't imagine being more proud of my son, you know? It was the only contest he ever saw me surfing on tour. And, uh, you know, he, I had never, he had never expressed to me before how proud he was of me. And it was, it was really special, obviously. Um, and, uh, j but just to see him, you know, he walked, he went down the beach away from everybody so my friends didn't see him and he was just crying by himself. And, uh, and he wasn't well then, right? No, he was. He was a few months from passing away. He, uh, he died about four months later um, from cancer. But it was, it was really amazing to uh, have that moment, you know, have, to have that time with him and hear him say that to me. And, uh, you know, my, my mom has always told me how proud she is of me she, and how thankful she is of, you know, things I've done for her and my family and stuff. But, you know, she's, she's never, let it pass. She, she lets me know how proud she is all the time, you know. But my dad, that was really the one time my dad actually one to one just said, God, I'm so proud of you, and I just want, want you to know that. And, uh, yeah, so pretty, pretty uh, overwhelming feeling at the time. I was trying to, like, still be, like, oh, no, I could have won that heat. I should have taken that way. He's like, <laughs> my dad's crying. I'm just like, oh, God, I feel like a jerk right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in your mindset when you've won six titles, five in a row, 98, and you go, I'm out. When you've been doing something 20 years, like pretty focused, or at least seven, like 17 years at that time, pretty focused competitively, week in, week out, you start to sort of burn the candle down. And, and um, What did you think you were going to do? Did, did you think you were really finished? No, no, I, I knew that it was a temporary thing. I, so I retired for three years when I was 26. My daughter at this time was two years old. She was born while I was on tour in 96. So I, I just wanted some time for my family and my personal life. And The band? Yeah. Appropriately yeah. named the Surfers? Were you guys good? Or was this kind of like we a... We sold f seven million records. Liar. Joke. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, um, 
You could entertain. I honestly, I honestly have had people come up to me and go, that's my favorite record I've ever listened to. I'm like, are you serious? Is it on my, iTunes? My buddy who, um, he's one of the managers of Pearl Jam, and he goes, he, his name's Kelly. He, he always comes up and goes, Kelly, one of my favorite records of all time. Because he's a, I don't, we, we were produced by T-Bone Burnett, who did the Counting Crows, who did, my he worked God. with Dylan, he worked with Wallflowers, he worked, I mean, you keep going down the and list. And he's a Hollywood legend for scoring Absolutely. movies and shows. Yeah, so I got into this, I, on that time off, I really got into music. Why do you go back in 2001? I mean, what, what are you trying to accomplish? What's um, driving you? As an athlete, you're looking for greatness. You're looking for your best. You're looking for, to do, to, to do something you haven't done before, to, to accomplish something that people say you can't do. You know, there's a, there's a great MMA fighter named Anderson Silva, and he said, he said, I just, he had a great quote. He said, I just do things that other people think are impossible and I don't see them as impossible. And I thought, what a great quote, you know, because that's really the feeling you have as an athlete. You want to be able to do things that haven't been done before, that no one's ever done, and that you only can imagine, you, you know, if you can imagine it, you can create it. And I've always felt that way, you know, like one of my favorite people in, in history was Nikola Tesla, who invented radio. He invented uh, wireless communications 115 years ago. He tapped Niagara Falls for free energy. Uh, hydropower he you know he had all these ideas and he always said if you can imagine it it exists and you can create it how'd it you know? go initially well I, I felt like my surfing was at a really good level but I had a I had an incident with Andy Irons who uh, has passed away um, I had an incident with Andy he and I had this crazy battle for the world title in 2003 and, and this is as you're coming back in yeah, this is my second year back full-time on the tour Andy was on his way up he had won the world title in 2002 in 2003, I, I got myself really back in the mix, and it was he and I down. I would win one, then he would win one, then we'd make a final together, then he would win one, then I would win one. And we were back and forth, and I think we each won three events that year or something, and, and we had a couple of seconds to each other. And we got to the beach, the final heat of the final day. I mean, this thing was, like, scripted again. It was crazy, because, like, we go into pipeline basically at a dead heat, but whoever beats the other by one result is gonna win the world title, no matter what places those are. If I get fifth and he gets third, he wins, or if I get second and he gets third, I win. So we get to the final, it's a four-man heat. We're about to go out. I have a whole lot of personal things playing out from in my life behind the scenes with a, a, a girlfriend at the time, and my personal life, and my own confidence, and, you know, problems going on in your life. I woke up that morning and I just, I just knew. I just like, this is not my day. No, my, I don't think I can turn this thing around. I had a, just a lump in my throat, and it just, my gut felt like I wanted to throw up all day. And then we got into the competition, and I started winning a heat, and then Andy would win a heat, and then I would win a heat. And, and next thing you know, we're in this final together. And I went, before we went out in the final, I went up to him, and it was a weird thing because Andy was younger than me, but I kind of looked at him like an, he, he reminded me of my older brother a lot. So we had this real crazy rivalry together that, well, you know, they made movies about us and stuff in the surf world and talked about it a lot, and there was a reality to it. We, behind it, we, were, we had a friendship and respect for each other, but, you know, he and I will each, there would never be another, I could never have another rival like this, you know. We represented so many different things in our lives and everything, but around the scenes, we got, we got along, but I went up to him before the heat, and. No one, was, no one could hear us. It was this close to him. I just said, man, I love you. Just good luck. And everyone thought I was trying to totally mess with him. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I would, in my heart, I was kind of going, take it easy on me, you know? Because I've had a bad day. And I, I feel like shit. And I'd rather not even be here right now. And no, no, one, no one else knew that. Everyone else thought, Kelly's trying to mind fuck him, you know, and all this mind games, and he's, he's the best at mind games, and that's the only way he can win, and all this. And I'm going, well, no, that's not at all what I'm doing. No one knows what I'm doing, because they don't know me. And right. They don't know what my purpose is. What did he say back? He kind of looked at me like, you're weird, man. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right, man, good luck. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He went out and won the heat and had a big celebration. <laughs> and I had, like... I just went home and cried. <laughs> but, you know, and to me, competitively, I had the best days of my life ever competitively at Pipeline, and I had the worst day of my life ever at Pipeline. Well, you came in third in, what, 2004? Yeah, and then you, you did. Even, yeah. I'm here to tell you, Thank you came you. in third. <laughs> 2005, I won the world title again. That's incredible. It was bizarre. I won 2005, I won 2006, I won 2008. 
2010, and then in 2011. They announced that I won the world title. And I went home that night, and it was cool. Like, we celebrated at the beach, blah, blah. I went home that night, and I looked. I just went, OK, I just want to double check this. I haven't won yet. Our tour had added up the potential numbers wrong, and I went home and figured out, like, I was reading these blogs online. This guy said, well, if Kelly does this, and then this guy wins these two, it looks like they're tied. And I was like, God, that guy's totally correct. And I don't know who that guy was. <laughs> but I, I, I called, I, I, I literally went on my Twitter, and I just tweeted out, I said, I haven't won the world title yet. I'm not joking. <laughs> and people were like, what, what, what? And it turned into this whole debacle. And then I had all that pressure to go, and I had to win this heat the next day against a different competitor and like a different expectation and all this stuff. Well, let's watch this, because this is a serious way for Kelly Slater off the back, looking over his shoulder on his back end. Big hook in the pocket, getting down to the frothy bottom, off the top, right on the money. <laughs> Kelly Slater, your 11-time world champion, and here comes the crest. I had to surf against two rookies. To become the oldest champion <clears throat> To become, yeah, to become the oldest champion. And um, so. I like how you build it up, and then when we get to the punchline, you're like, yeah, it's going to become the oldest champion. <laughs> well, to be honest, I, um, I, I mean, I, I like the longevity aspect of it, that I'm the oldest world champion, but... That's incredible to me. It's been, is it surprising to you that you've been able, that you were able to win one when you were basically a kid, a pup, 20, and then yeah. you're, you're winning one as you're approaching 40? Yeah, I won one at 20, and I won one at 39. Um, I think of surfing like, to me, it's like a martial art. And I don't know why you would start going backwards at martial arts. You would always get more, inf you, would, you would learn more, you would get better. You know, when you become a black belt, you, don't, you then don't fall into being a blue belt again. Or, I mean, maybe you do if you don't do it for years and years. But if you're consistently going, you're going to start, you know, notching up other belts and, and other accolades along with it. So to me, surfing is uh, it's a depth of knowledge about the ocean, about equipment about you know your understanding of yourself we have this quote <clears throat> surfing is my religion if i have one what does this quote mean to you i'm not a religious person um but surfing to me is a spiritual thing it's a it's it's to me i i sort of like i've always felt like the ocean and surfing and even even competitive results in some ways like a spiritual feedback for me um, you know, when things are, when you're, when you're on the right path, I, I, I believe, for me, when, when I'm on the right path, I'm doing the right things, I'm treating people the right way, I'm going about it the right way with the right intention, the right things happen back for me. And so, you know, surfing is kind of like the physical aspect of that for me. It, it, it's, it's the physical feedback, you know, when the right wave appears, when the right thing happens, you know, and then on the flip side of that, you know, the, all the wrong things can happen. You can miss the wave you wanted, and then, the, you know, then a wave lands on your head, and, or you, get, you know, you hit the reef and cut yourself. Did that last week. Um, it, it, all these things kind of give you a different feedback, you know, and I just use them as, like, little messages to kind of um, guide my life. You kind of touched on it earlier. Th there's an inherent danger in what you do. We, it's not just sharks. I mean, it's, it's a wave that does something yeah, that you're not expecting. Yeah, I mean, I've, had, I've, had, I've lost a lot of friends. Drownings and all sorts of things. Have you ever been under thinking, I'm not getting out of this? Um, yeah, I've had a couple sort of scary moments. Um, probably the worst one, I got knocked out. I wiped down this wave. I hit my head really hard, like, on my temple. It knocked me out. And I was underwater, I think, for about 30 seconds from what we figured out. And I had amnesia for about 12 hours, and um, I, I was in shock for a long time. Numerous friends I, I've known over the years drowned and um, been there for one or two of them, two, a couple of them. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, our sport is very different in that we don't have a lot of really bad injuries, but the bad ones are really bad, like, you know, a shark attack or a drowning. But it's, we do it because we love it, you know? We, it's, we're not going out and surfing because of the money we're making. We're not going out and surfing for the fame of it or, like, to be a sports star. Like, that's, this is the outlet we have to have a life around something we love to do. And we, every single one of us would be doing that if we didn't have a job doing it, you know? Uh, what's next for you? I talked about wave pools earlier. I won a contest in a wave pool as a kid. It's always been like a fascination of surfers to have a good wave in a wave pool. And most of them have been pretty bad. So 
we're building a private pool right now. It's in California, kind of at a secret location. <laughs> um, um, it's in Roswell, yeah. Mexico. Um, <laughs> Aliens are surfing on it. Yeah, right it's now. Area 51. And um, and but we we our plan with it is for it to be a private pool because it's going to be kind of our true full scale test model. You know, we will be inviting people in there and we'll we'll have memberships and stuff like that for a certain amount of people. Is this but, something that could go across the country though, is and maybe bring surfing to some kid? It, it in could, yeah. It Minnesota. Could, it could be in any place. But you know, the surf culture is near the beach. I mean, let's not deny that. But it's also, I mean, if you're gonna look into another place, a lot of snowboarders surf in the off season they're surfing and if they don't want to uproot from like, you know, wherever they're at in Park City or Aspen or wherever, you know, there could be potentially one in those areas. But I think it would be hard to recreate the surf culture in a wave pool. You know, I don't expect that. I see it as more like a supplement, like a vitamin or something, you know. Right. Want to be healthy, eat a good diet, but also maybe take some, you know, a wave pool here and there. I know um, you've got this new clothing line you just yeah, launched. Yeah, I got it. These are my clothes. Um, I la launched a clothing line called Outer Known. You know, I wanted to do clothing in a sustainable environmentally friendly way and look after every aspect of the process, every stage of the process from inception to final product. And so it was really the only way for me to go and do it the way I wanted to. And um, so, yeah, that's one of my big things I'm working on day in, day out. All right, now this is how we wrap these up. Five fun questions with Kelly Slater. You ready? All right. Would you, re would you rather be stuck on a broken ski lift or in a broken elevator? Um, ski lift, for sure. Really? Absolutely. No. Hanging questions. out, well, why would you What's What, care? stuck and you feel like the oxygen is all going to like be gone soon? <laughs> yeah. Mean, and then you got to climb out and then you got this whole elevator shaft to deal with? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ski lift. I mean, what's going to, what's the worst? You sit there for a while and go to sleep. I mean. <laughs> you would. <laughs> would you rather be only able to jump everywhere you go or only be able to walk on your hands? Oh, man. We play, the, we, we play this game all the time. What would you rather do with yeah. my friends? <laughs> right. I think I'd rather, rather walk on my hands. Imagine how strong your upper body would be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> would you rather have a rewind button or a pause button on your life? Ooh. Probably pause. Because? Is that one of the questions? Yeah. Is that it? I just added one. Um, I think pause, well, I use it for a very specific reason because I would imagine myself in giant surf putting myself in the exact right position and if I got to the wrong position, I'd be like, pause. <laughs> so now, All right, go again. Would you rather live one life that lasts a thousand years or 10 lives that last 100 years each? 10, 10 lives. I've actually always wanted to have 10 of me. <laughs> I swear, I, I love so many things. I want to go and just like experience each one. I, I've said for years and years, I tell a friend of mine all the time, I wish I had 10 of me so I could do all these things I want to do and really fully experience each of them. I think, I think a thousand years would be, I mean, look, a hundred years might be a little sad because you're going to lose a lot of friends, but a thousand years is going to be super sad. You're going to lose like lots and lots of friends. But you'd make so many new ones. <laughs> You would make new ones, but like, I don't know, I think you'd want to just like psh, wipe, the, wipe the slate clean and start over, you know? I, I'd rather have 10. I'd vote for 10 of you. Yeah, that'd be fun. How about a round of applause for our guest, Kelly Slater? Thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. That's it. Good night. Thank you. All right.